How do you choose which charities or ministries to financially support? Do you consider the priorities of its mission? Do you investigate its effectiveness? Or are you simply swayed by emotional appeals? Welcome to Through the Bible. Today, our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, shares two important points to consider before giving money to any organization, including this one. I'm Steve Schweitz, your host, and we're in Romans 15, beginning with verse 25. So go ahead, grab your copy of God's Word, and hop aboard the Bible bus. And as you find your seat, I want to share a couple of letters from our fellow passengers from around the world. First, we hear from a listener of our Gondi language broadcast in India. I belong to a Hindu family, and we used to worship the images of different gods and goddesses twice a day. However, there was no peace in my family. One day, I asked a neighbor for guidance, and he told me about your program. At first, I was against listening, but one day, I was feeling hopeless and tuned in. That day, I felt peace and light in my heart. Then I continued to listen to the program regularly with my family. Slowly, I developed faith in Jesus Christ and accepted Him as my Lord. Now all the members of our family have accepted Jesus as our Savior. We have been listening to this program for the past nine years and have become members of a local church. I take time to share my testimony with other villagers and motivate them to tune in and hear you. I also share your words with all my relatives and friends because I want all of them to know Jesus and have eternal life. What a great letter. Next, we hear from a listener in Poland. You have encouraged me to look to the Bible for answers to my own problems. I'm amazed to find how much God's Word can teach me, or rather, how much God can teach me through the Bible. He shows me how many things in myself have to be changed. But knowing His love and grace, I trust Him and take another step forward. Don't you just love that? Knowing His love and grace, I trust Him and take another step forward. May we all do that today. Well, our last letter comes from uh, California, Dana Point specifically. Thank you for your faithfulness. I have made one round trip starting in the blackest darkness and riding the Bible bus into the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, my Savior. During this past five years, my father died, my business failed, and my house went up for auction. But God has always been faithful, and my confidence in Him only grows stronger each day. Feeding on His Word regularly has helped. His Word leads to freedom. Praise the Lord for your ministry to me. Well, those are sure encouraging words from our fellow listeners, aren't they? Well, if God's Word is changing your heart and your life, and how can it not? We'd certainly love to hear your story, too. Why don't you share it by emailing us at BibleBus at ttb.org, or you can write that letter to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109, or in Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Or join our vibrant Facebook community and leave a message there. Now let's listen to Dr. McGee introduce today's program and then lead us into our study with prayer. Now today we're going to do some reviewing here in Romans as we're getting close to the end of this very wonderful book. And I trust that this part of the bus trip has really been very wonderful for you. I trust this blessed your heart in a very new way. I trust Romans has stretched your imagination and that as someone wrote and put it to me like this, look back and praise him. Look ahead and trust him. Look around and serve him. Look up and expect him. So for those of you that have got eyes and those of you that do not have physical eyes, This is something that we all can do. Now, let us come to our study, and as we do, shall we look to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that the Spirit of God may indeed be our teacher, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, friends, we put in here at verse 27, but before we do, let me go back to verses 25 and 26, where we left off last time. Just tie these strings together. Paul said, you will recall, he says, and I'll read my translation now, but now I'm proceeding on my journey to Jerusalem, ministering to the saints, for it seemed good of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain fellowship. Paul called giving a fellowship, to make a certain fellowship to the poor of the saints which are at Jerusalem. You see, you have fellowship. Christians have fellowship with God and 
with Christ and with one another when you give, friends. Actually, that's a fellowship. And fellowship doesn't mean patting somebody on the back. That's not fellowship. That's knife and fork club. They meet every week, these knife and fork clubs. And that's fellowship as far as they're concerned. But fellowship is sharing the things of Christ. And Paul said he wanted to go to Jerusalem. Now, he persecuted the church. And he says, I want to have fellowship with them. I want to take a gift up there. And we read in Acts 24, 17, Paul gives the historical record of what he did. He says, now after many years, I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings. And this collection was a great burden on the heart of this great apostle. You'll find him writing about it in 2 Corinthians. In fact, the 8th and ninth chapter is all about it. Now I come to verse 27. It hath pleased them verily. And their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. Now, Paul makes it clear that it was a free will offering. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Now, that's 2 Corinthians 9, 7, and this is the offering Paul took up. But Paul makes something else very clear, and that it's not only a free will offering. They couldn't give any other way to please God. But he also enforces the fact that they had a moral obligation and debt to pay. The Gentiles had received the gospel from the nation Israel. And in John 4, 22, our Lord said, Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. The gospel began at Jerusalem. Macedonia and Achaia were obligated to Jerusalem. And some of the saints in Jerusalem were having financial difficulties because of the persecution. And Macedonia and Achaia can now pay a spiritual debt in the coin of the realm. And this is foreign missions in reverse, by the way. It's the missionary church up in the home church. And that may take place for we are through today, by the way, in this day in which we're living. And when you see the economy of our country and see what's happening abroad, the nations that we were victorious over today, they are prosperous and we're the ones in debt. And it looks like we're going to have to learn to lose a war in order to be victorious and win. Germany and Japan, they're prosperous. The United States going in the other direction, apparently. Now, will you notice? I'm going to read now verse 28. When therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. My, that was on the heart of the great apostle Paul. And notice the zeal that he had. He had a zeal in taking the gift to Jerusalem. And that, of course, placed him in the hands of his enemies who had him arrested. And he wasn't out of the will of God during that time. I disagree with some of my brethren here. I think Paul was absolutely in the will of God when he went up to Jerusalem. Now, we saw that when we were in the book of Acts. And he says here that he wanted to seal to them this fruit. Now, that is an awkward phrase for us. And it couldn't mean no more than he wanted a receipt for the offering. He secured to them the gift. It probably means, however, that he wanted the Jerusalem church to see some fruits of their missionary efforts. And I personally believe that if you're going to give to anything, you ought to know what it's giving. I don't want to get on this subject of Christian giving today, but I think that's another area in which there is grave danger. I do not think you ought to give to anything unless two things about it. You ought to know what it's doing, and you ought to be dead sure that it's getting out the Word of God, and that Word of God is being effective in hearts and lives. I don't think, Christian friend, you have any right to give to a work because somebody's made some emotional and sentimental appeal to you and showed you some pictures of little orphans and said, my, you ought to give. How much goes for overhead? How much really gets out 
to the orphans. Do you really know where your giving is going? Is it getting the Word of God out? Well, I listened to a program when I was back east, a local program. And the best I could tell, the fellow never gave people anything. He's just asking them to give for something else. And it just looked to me like what he was doing was saying, send in money to continue me on the air so that tomorrow I'll be able to get back on the radio and ask you again for the next day. May I say to you, I feel that we ought to be sure what our giving is. And what he's doing here is he's saying, I want to take the gift of these Gentile believers to Jerusalem to let the Jerusalem church know that there's fruit out yonder on the field, that the word of God is going out and it is being effective and that it has a very practical bearing too, that it's helping the poor saints in Jerusalem. And then another thing, Paul says, after all, I wasted the church and I want to take it myself. I think he's in the will of God when he went to Jerusalem. Well, before I leave 28, let me come back there because I got off on this matter of giving today, and that's one of my hang-ups, I guess, where I go off. Now, verse 28, when therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. Now, did Paul go to Spain? How could he say here, I'm coming by you to Spain, and then didn't go to Spain, yet later on would be able to say, I finished my course? I don't think so. Now will you notice him in verse 29 here? And I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now this is Paul's stamp of approval on his prosperous journey to Rome. He went there according to the will of God and in the fullness of his apostolic office. God gave him divine insight into this trip. Paul's not out of the will of God, friends, in going to Jerusalem and also in going to Rome. It may not look like a prosperous journey, but God used it that way. And it's so easy for God's children because when trouble comes and Things begin to look dark and doubtful. They say, oh, am I in the will of God? I've talked to several people recently, and they're having a great deal of trouble, and their feelings are very much disturbed, and they're asking the question, am I in the will of God? My friend, just because you're having trouble and you're having disturbed feelings doesn't mean you're not in the will of God. In fact, it may mean you are in the will of God. Now, if you are in a calm today where nothing is happening and everything is just fine, then the chances are you're not in the will of God. Now, let me turn to verse 30. We're proceeding on through this chapter now. Now, I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit that ye strive together with me in prayers to God for me. Now, I've been dwelling a long time in this area. There are several reasons. One of the reasons is that this is very personal, and Paul is laying bare his heart, and we're seeing how Christianity functioned in the first century. We're seeing the practical side of it, and we're seeing a great many things working out that we ought to see. Paul has given us doctrine in the first part. And the practice is always to spend a long time with the doctrine. And I guess some of you thought we really spent a long time, and we did. But we're spending time here because we feel this, though it's practical, it's very important. Now, let me give you my translation. He says, now I beg of you, brethren, through our Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that ye strive intensely with me in your prayers to God on behalf of me. Now, here is one of the most solemn and earnest and serious appeals of Paul for prayer that you find in the Bible. Paul recognizes he's facing danger. He realizes that in his ministries come to a place which is a crisis, enemies on every hand. And he had reason to fear. The succeeding events prove that. 
And Paul is asking for prayer here in a very wonderful way. And he says, through our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul always, everything that was to come to him had to come through Jesus Christ. And he asked the believers in Roman Jerusalem, all of them, to join with him. And he is the intercessor through whom all believers must come. And I mean now the Lord Jesus. He says, I want all of you to pray through Christ, not to Christ, but through him. He's our great intercessor. Go through him to God and pray for me. And then through the love of the Spirit. Now, he means here by the love of the Spirit that love is the fruit of the Spirit which joins all believers together. And you know, we ought to all pray one for another. We ought to pray for each other. You ought to pray for me. I ought to pray for you too, by the way. Now, listen to him here, that you strive intensely with me, not against me, but with me. And this word for strive is a tremendous word. We get our English word agonize from it. But Paul uses it with the little preposition soon. That means with, soon agonize. Agonize with me. And prayer for Paul was a real exercise for this great apostle. I tell you, he prayed and it really meant something. And he's asking, pray on behalf of me. He asked for prayer for his personal safety that he might come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Oh, how we need this kind of praying today. Not just praying by rote, and prayer list is important. I have a prayer list, but I think that sometimes I go over that prayer list rather hurriedly. And prayer for the Apostle Paul was done with great agony, great exercise of soul. He laid hold of God. This is something that, again, that is so desperately needed today, this kind of praying. We need people who know how to pray for us. Now, verse 31 that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints. In other words, this is Paul's prayer request, and it's twofold. That his life was in jeopardy from unbelievers in Judea, the religious rulers, and he wanted to be delivered from them. And then the second thing is that the church in Jerusalem you know, might be hesitant in accepting a gift from Gentiles, and he wanted them to accept. And as a result, both prayers were answered. Somebody says, but he was arrested. Sure, but he was put immediately in the hands of the Romans, and it enabled him to appear before kings and fulfill the will of God for the apostle Paul, and finally to actually go before the Caesar in Rome. He appealed to him. Now, verses 32 and 33, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God and may with you be refreshed. Now, the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Now, this is the conclusion of Paul's prayer request. The prayer was answered. His life was spared. The church in Jerusalem accepted the gift. He did come with joy to Rome, although Two years in jail at Caesarea was spent in patience and a shipwreck on the way. And finally he arrived and he was in chains. But Paul came in the joy of the Holy Spirit. Oh, how we need that kind of joy today in the lives of believers and all of us need it. Now, did Paul find rest and refreshment in Rome? Well, the answer's debatable. He did find all these I think, and more beyond Rome and Spain. Listen to him in 2 Timothy again, 4, 6, and 8. This is important for us to see. He says, For I am now ready to be often, and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth that is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but all them also that love is appearing. 
Now he says the God of peace. That shows that Paul knew peace down in prison, in chains, and in storm and shipwreck. And I pray that you might know that and that I might know that kind of peace today that Paul had. Now we come to the last chapter, Romans, and we see in this chapter the relationship of Christians to one another, and it's going to be demonstrated. Here again, the gospel walks in shoe leather in the first century in the Roman Empire, and believe me, this is the thing that thrills my heart, is in that pagan empire of Rome, there were Christians walking down the streets of those cities, witnesses for Christ. The joy of the Lord was in their heart. And I think this is one of the most revealing chapters that we have in the epistle to the Romans. Paul's going to leave the mountain peaks of doctrine, as he's already done, to come down to the pavements of Rome. Here we see Christianity walking in shoe leather on the streets of first century pagan Rome. This is Christianity in action. These great doctrines that Paul proclaimed are not missiles for outer space. They're not to be used to go to the moon, but they're vehicles which actually ran on Roman roads. The gospel was translated into life and into reality. This remarkable chapter should not be omitted or neglected in any study of Romans. Dr. Newell has made this comment. He says this 16th chapter is neglected by many to their loss. How true. Now, there are 35 persons that are mentioned by name here. All were either believers living in Rome or they were believers that were with the apostle Paul. And he probably was in Corinth when he wrote this epistle. There is expressed a mutual love and tender affection, which was a contradiction of Roman philosophy and practice. And it's rather unlike some churches today. These Christians were different. Little wonder that Rome marveled at these Christians and said, my, how these Christians love each other. Now, in this final chapter, we have first the commendation of Phoebe who was the bearer of this epistle. And then we have Christians in Rome are greeted, verses 3 through 15. Then we have the conduct toward other Christians, verses 16 through 20. And then Christians with Paul send greetings, verses 21 and 24. And then the concluding benediction, verses 25 and 27. Now we have first commendation of Phoebe. Listen to him. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant, that is a deaconess of the church, which is at Sencrea, that ye receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succorer of many and of myself also. This is a prominent woman in the early church. Quite remarkable was a woman that carried this epistle to Rome. My, what an important document she had. And we're going to have to save that next time. And until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Clearly, Phoebe held an important place in the early church. To learn more about Dr. McGee's biblical position on women in the church, visit the resource section of ttb.org to download our free digital booklet titled Woman's Place in the Local Church. Next time, we'll hear more about Phoebe and others who assisted Paul in his ministry as we come to our last study in this great book of Romans. If you'd like to spend a little more time in your own personal study of Romans, listen to any of these messages in our study of Romans again, or download our Bible Companion for Romans for free, just go to ttb.org. And of course, you can always call us, 1-800-65-BIBLES, the number, if you need any help finding what you're looking for. Now, our next study is going to be terrific as well, so let's read ahead through all of Romans 16. You know, reading ahead before each study is a great discipline that helps you get the most out of your time in God's Word. 
visit the resources section of ttb.org and click on newsletters and bookmarks to download a copy of the reading schedule bookmark. I'm Steve Schwetz, praying God's grace and peace will be with you today as you follow him. Through the Bible is a five-year study of God's entire Word, and together we discover God's purposes in history and our lives, found only when we believe in Jesus Christ. Do you know Him yet?